Professor Regan is a scientist. A scientist with a dream. She's putting any product that uses science to sell under the microscope. And making sure every marketing claim is true to its worth. She wants to know when it comes to adverts, can we believe the science? Because she's creating a magic emporium where everything does exactly what it says on the tin. This week, she's investigating the products found on our pharmacy shelves, a multi-million pound industry. She'll be drawing on her medical expertise as a doctor. I, I'm, I'm having problems understanding how this droplet is going to change the rest of me. And her own experiences of being a patient. And then I thought, but this shouldn't happen to me, this happens to other people. And then thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? From painkillers to homeopathy, she'll discover just how to pick the best remedies. My goodness, there are so many brands of painkillers to choose from. I, I don't know how you make a choice. So she can be sure her money is well spent on products that really work. If we believe the ads, there should be plenty of products worth a place in her medicine cabinet. But only those with evidence that really stands up will make it into Professor Regan's pharmacy. For 14 years, Professor Regan has run the obstetrics and gynaecology department at St. Mary's Hospital. Hi, Patrick. It's uh, Prof. Regan speaking. Every treatment and drug used in her clinic is backed up by rigorous scientific research. Another, another bad hair day. <laughs> scientific proof really means something. But medicine is no longer just restricted to hospitals and doctor's surgeries. It's on the internet and in the high street. I can get a free consultation and buy a scooter all on the same shopping trip. Everyone seems to be cashing in on our fears of getting sick. Is there anywhere in this high street that doesn't want to sell me a health check? But surely, when we're in a pharmacy, we can be sure every product has the type of scientific backing that Professor Regan likes to see. Can't we? She wants to know, is there a perfect painkiller? Can anything stop you getting a cold? Do homeopathic and herbal remedies work? And is there a health check that could stop you ever getting ill? If so, then Professor Regan is going to find them. One group of people who've probably tried more remedies than most are insomniacs. Hugh, Kate and Alex have been dealing with insomnia for years. I haven't slept probably for four days. It's like walking around with a sack of potatoes on your back. Woke up about uh, three or four times during the night, which is quite a usual thing for me. Didn't get much sleep at all um, Sunday night, Monday morning, and had real, real difficulty concentrating. I wake up at four and have just kind of laid here ever since. I feel, I still feel quite dreadful. I feel like I've been run over by a bus. I just don't understand why I can't sleep through the night like everybody else. Nearly four in ten of us will suffer from insomnia at least once in our lives. What if there was a totally safe medicinal remedy that could cure this? One with no side effects. A treatment that also claims to offer cures for everything from headaches to depression, impotence to morning sickness. Homeopathy is the fastest growing form of complementary medicine, trusted by nine million people in the UK alone. 
Nowadays, you can pick up homeopathic remedies in most high street chemists. Do you know, I had absolutely no idea that there were quite so many homeopathic remedies on offer. It's absolutely extraordinary. This is Babery tincture for cold, flu, coughs, sore throat and digestive disorders. Fatigue fighter, I expect everyone needs this. Promote healthy energy levels, reduce routine tiredness. Homeopathic remedy for insomnia. It tells me, a bad night's sleep is often the result of stress. A refreshing natural night's sleep will help reduce that stress. I'm sure they're right. Homeopathy promises to treat mental, physical, even emotional illnesses without any side effects. Homeopaths, like Tony Pincus, say it's because of the unique way they make the remedies. What I'm going to do is to make the first dilution. This is the beginning stage of making a remedy. And in order to do that, I'm going to take 99 drops of alcohol. And I'm going to take my remedy, which is the arnica. And I'm going to add just one drop into this vial. There's one drop. And now I'm going to shake this very vigorously 20 times. has now become the first centesimal potency, which is the starting point, diluting it one part in a hundred in each of the subsequent tubes. As we progressively dilute and shake, you can improve the effectiveness of the remedy and also take away the side effects. So it's a win-win situation. By the time it has been diluted 12 times, it's highly unlikely a single molecule of the original droplet will remain. But according to the principles of homeopathy, the more dilute a preparation becomes, the more powerful it gets. This machine, which is called the Pincus Potentizer, will allow us to make very high potencies. The dilutions go as high as 100,000 dilutions to one in 100 which is a phenomenal number of dilutions, but it's the highest potency that homeopaths tend to use. And that takes 14 days using the machine, but it could take months and months by hand. With a standard strength homeopathic dose of 30 dilutions, you'd need a bottle of remedy not only bigger than you, but 30 billion times bigger than the Earth to be guaranteed to get just one molecule of active ingredient. The products for sale in Tony Pincus's pharmacy are nothing like the medicine Professor Regan usually gives her seal of approval to. Hi, I'm Tony Pincus, homeopathic pharmacist. Leslie Regan, thank you very much for coming to meet me. It looks um, intriguing here. What we're tapping into with homeopathy in essence is the innate ability to cure oneself. When you have symptoms, the symptoms themselves are part of the healing process rather than the disease. So it's really principle that like can cure like. Now, if a patient came to you and said, look, I've got streaming eyes, I'm sneezing, and I've got a sore throat, that would be a remedy picture that would respond to onion. So I would give them onion as a homeopathic remedy in order to treat that particular condition. But I find that very difficult to understand because we're talking about a tiny, 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 tiny dilution, aren't we? Or rather a massive dilution and a tiny amount of active ingredient, one in hundreds of thousands of parts. And I, I, I'm, I'm having problems understanding how this droplet is going to change the rest of me. We are still in a position where science hasn't caught up with, with homeopathy. But nothing is sensitive enough to recall uh, materials that have such a high dilution. But we know from our experience that the remedies do work and they have been working for 
the last three centuries. So trying to explain it to a conventional scientist is more and more difficult because we don't have the wherewithal in science as it is today to actually be able to do that. But one day we will. But is modern science really struggling to catch up with homeopathy? A surprising number of scientific studies have been done on these products. Professor Regan has three golden rules for examining all scientific papers. Rule one, the results are published in a reputable scientific journal. Rule two, the trials are done on a large enough group of people that any positive results are significant. And rule three, the trials are carried out with a control group given placebo pills or treatment for comparison. Will the studies into homeopathy pass these tests? <music> Professor Regan has sent a decade's worth of trial papers to statistician Professor David Spiegelhalter, the Professor of Understanding of Risk at Cambridge University. This is a man who spends his life using these golden rules to critically examine medical papers. Well, when I first looked at these studies, um, I think I was quite surprised because a number of them have been very well done by good teams, published in reputable journals, and they come out with some positive findings. But they tend just not to be big enough. Even the good ones are just not big enough to be convincing. And so when you start looking at the larger studies, those that have been properly randomized and blinded, then the evidence for homeopathy steadily gets smaller and smaller. And that means that in the end, if you did a really big study, you might find almost no effect at all. So for me, the evidence for homeopathy is not convincing. So why do so many people think homeopathy works for them? The placebo effect is the power of a treatment to work just because we believe it works. But all placebos can do is boost our own natural healing mechanisms. If something is beyond the capacity of the body to heal altogether, then no amount of believing is going to change that. Now, homeopathy works very well for pain, all sorts of pain. It works very well for swelling, for nausea, and for all the conditions that we know to be placebo responsive. And that in itself suggests that homeopathy may be itself a pure placebo. For placebos to work, they have to be believably scientific. Homeopathic practitioners are experts in the placebo effect, even maybe without realizing it. They'll use scientific-looking procedures to prepare their remedies. They'll wear similar kind of scientific-looking clothing, and they will surround their whole practice with a sort of aura of science precisely to give it that sense of importance that will encourage the belief in the treatment and therefore the placebo effect. If homeopathy really is down to the placebo effect, Professor Regan ought to be able to create an equally successful remedy using just a simple sugar pill and a lot of credible-sounding scientific jargon. She's going to test it out on our insomniacs. Now this is my very own sleep remedy. And what I'm doing here is I'm putting a month's supply of my sleep remedy into these little bottles and then we're going to give them to all of our volunteers. But what they don't know is that these little silver balls are actually sugar-based cake decorations. To turn these sweets into a sleep remedy, she needs to make them sound scientific. So I'm going to give you all two each to take home. Each volunteer was dispatched with a bottle of pills and a precise set of instructions. Take two of them and pop them under your tongue. They're going to dissolve under your tongue. So it's really important that you don't have anything that's strongly flavoured to eat or to drink uh, for at least 20 minutes uh, prior to taking the medication. No nicotine and no toothpaste. So nothing can disturb the absorption of the active ingredients under your tongue. 
but in total you can have up to six tablets um, per night. So you've got your pills and you've got your diaries. Any questions? No, I just hope it works. Having monitored their bad sleep patterns for four days, the volunteers were then allowed to take the tablets. Um, I had my first uh, dose of the new remedy last night. Um, got off sleep fine. Um, wake up once, uh, but got. I took um, another two tablets and seemed to get back to sleep quite quickly. I started drifting off and uh, I fell asleep. It was quite remarkable. Took two of the remedy and, you know, as I said, went out like a light. I took my second dose of the remedy last night and actually slept through till five o'clock this morning, which is pretty good going for me. I managed to sleep right the way through um, without waking up at all. I, I was quite surprised. Something seems to be working. I uh, feel full of energy this morning. A week later, they come back to tell Professor Regan the good news. So welcome back, everybody. Thank you very, very much for coming. Now, this is what you've all come to hear, uh, what actually was in this special sleep remedy. So, what I'm going to tell you now is actually there was no active ingredient in those pills. <laughs> they were placebos or sugar pills. Mm -hmm. My sort of reaction to what you've been telling me is that the first couple of nights, the, the wanting to believe that it would work may actually have had a positive effect. Would you agree? Yes. I was just so looking forward to trying it and actually looking forward to night time coming round to try it and actually getting that good night's sleep. But it's funny how he and I did sleep better those first yeah. two days. But the positive side of all of this is that it does seem that you had a couple of nights of better sleep. Professor Regan's sleeping pills worked because of the placebo effect. If homeopathy also works because of the placebo effect, could that be enough for Professor Regan to find a place for it in her pharmacy? It's true that some people do feel that they benefit from homeopathy. And you could argue that since it's not doing them any harm, well, why not? But I don't think there's any robust evidence to support the view that homeopathic products are any better than a placebo. So from a personal point of view, I'd find it very difficult to recommend them to people. In the end, the scientific trial data wins the day. Homeopathy is out. Next on the list, the thing we most commonly buy in a pharmacy, painkillers. Well, I've been working as a doctor for 28 years, and I know when it comes to painkillers, there are three main types. There's aspirin, paracetamol, and ibuprofen. And they work by different mechanisms, but those are the three main painkillers. So why is it that when I go to my local chemist shop, I can find all of these different preparations. There's a huge variety of painkillers out there, but behind the marketing, they break down into two quite distinct camps. The first type are shiny and glossy, beautifully packaged. They come out with a perfect pop. They can cost up to 10 times more than the second type. These are the cheap and not so cheerful looking generic painkillers. The packaging says it all. They're plain, no nonsense, straightforward pills. Two different types of pills for two different types of customer. I'm a brand person. Paracetamol is what I have. Just the ordinary paracetamol. I don't know what it is. The pink one looks like Smarties. Ibuprofen. Uh, generic. Yeah. Oh, it's generic. Known brands, actually, yeah. Oh, definitely Neurofen, man. Yeah, you need to buy Neurofen, of course. That's the only one that works. Trust me. I've used every single one of them. That's the only one that works. 
If all these branded tablets contain the same active ingredient as this generic option, can they really be any better at killing pain? Is it worth forking out the extra dosh for the posh pills? The Chiswick Rugby Club are about to find out. It's all about the big hits. So you just put your body on the line, so you come off pretty roughed up at the end of the game. Serious injuries, I broke a leg. Tore shoulder ligaments. Fingers have gone, that sort of thing. Once the whistle goes, uh, you, don't, you don't feel the pain. Is afterwards when the when the pain kicks in. We're going to inflict some controlled pain on the team, but first, they get to pick a best-selling brand of painkiller to lend them a helping hand. Anything I've used for a headache. I'm going on the ambient box. Anything. It takes an hour for most painkillers to properly kick in, so the boys have a bit of respite before the experiment begins. They'll be tested to see how long they can keep their hands in a bucket of ice-cold water before the pain gets too much. Uh, it's pretty cold, but it's not that cold. As the boys' hands hit the cold water, their bodies produce chemicals to transmit a pain message up to the brain. All painkillers work by blocking these chemicals, either at the source of pain or in the brain. It's starting to, it's starting to hurt. Oh, geez, that is cold. Fewer pain messages reaching the brain means the pain feels less intense, and the boys will be able to keep their hands in the ice longer. We can be here for a little while. Lost a bit of feeling. Oh, geez. They do contain clinically proven chemicals, so it's no surprise the branded tablets work. My hand's still moving, so it's okay. I think the painkillers might have staved off a little bit of it. On average, they manage to keep their hands in the ice for six minutes. And that's about where I get out. So <laughs> it's about now. So will they notice any difference when they do the test again, this time, taking unbranded drugs? <laughs> it certainly looks cheaper than the yeah, anodin, doesn't it? Well, yeah. I think it's all about the ingredients, really, because yeah. that's all you take. It's the same yeah. stuff, isn't it? Then, that's yeah. the same thing, I'll have it. Credit crunch drugs, Yenny, that's what you need. That's what we call it. <laughs> We're too clever to be fooled by packaging, aren't oh, we? Of course, yeah. you know. The active ingredients of generic and branded products are often the same. So is the extra cash we spend on the branded products just a waste of money? If so, our rugby team should find they can hold out against the cold just as well this time with the unbranded products. But will they? Oh, that does feel instantly colder this time. Oh, God. This is changing my mind about buying Neurofen in future. I will buy the branded stuff. Not such manly rugby players now. With the Neurofen, Will lasted eight minutes. This time, you can only take four. Huge difference, and I'm surprised by that. I really am. And Will wasn't the only one. That feels colder. <laughs> Straight away. I don't think I'll be able to hold my hand in as long as last time. Pete lasted just two minutes 40, nearly five minutes less than before. Jeez. And tough man Ron wasn't quite so hard this time around. Nearly 12 minutes, down to a paltry four. Yeah, that is a lot sore. As a group, they lasted a third longer with the branded drugs than what they thought were the cheap generic ones. But what the boys don't realize is that those cheap generic pills were no such thing. <laughs> so what you're saying is we're basically wimps. Yeah. <laughs> Inside the generic looking bottles were exactly the same branded tablet they took the first time, with just the packaging and the labeling removed. In this test, the secret to the branded pills power seems to have come from the fancy labels and nice names alone. 
Should we be taking exactly It's in your head. It is in your head. We're taking exactly the same stuff. It's half full though, is it? <laughs> That's unbelievable. I yeah. feel like such a mug. I was standing there sitting with my hand in the ice going, oh no, I'm definitely going to buy the branded stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> They're not mugs. A scientific trial has shown that branding really does give an extra degree of pain relief. A study of over 800 people by Keele University found that branded packets of painkillers gave 30% more pain relief than unbranded packets of exactly the same drug. It's not just branding that could enhance pain relief. Research has shown we also think one pill doesn't work as well as two, even if they add up to the same dose. We're convinced the more expensive a pill is, the better it is. And we even think larger tablets have a stronger effect than smaller ones. Unless they are very, very small, in which case we think they work the best. Many branded and generic drugs contain exactly the same ingredients. But the generics can be a fraction of the price. So surely only they will make it into Professor Regan's pharmacy. The ways in which these branded products are marketed sometimes provide an additional placebo benefit. So for some people, paying the extra for the branded variety may actually provide them with more pain relief. Generic painkillers make it into Professor Regan's pharmacy because they are pharmacologically proven to work. And because branded drugs contain the same ingredients, plus a possible boost from their branding, they also make it onto the shelves. The world of herbal medicines is an exotic and enticing one. No medicinal sounding names here. Anyone for Devil's Claw or Passion Flower? The Echinacea Super Plus. Echinacea and elderberry spray, which I put under my tongue. Milk thistle. St John's wort a lot, which is classic for depression. Skullcap, just to uh, keep me relaxed and uh, calm. It's true that many of these remedies have been around for hundreds of years. But we're talking about remedies that were originally used to treat saddle sores, snake bites and venereal disease. So why are we choosing these antiquated options over high-tech, clinically proven modern medicines? Herbal products are natural, and so I think are much safer than the chemicals. I think I have this um, conception that conventional medicine is, is bad and herbal medicine is good. Knowing it's a, a herbal, it's not going to have any real side effects as far as I'm concerned. Herbal remedies promise all the powers of modern medicines without any of the fear associated with pharmaceuticals. Can they really be as good as they sound? Professor Regan has come to Kew Gardens, home to the world's largest collection of plant species, to find out. Oh, hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Professor Monique Simmons runs the plant laboratory here at Kew. Plants are just fascinating chemists. Yeah. So they come up with really good diversity of compounds that sometimes a chemist just hasn't thought about. <laughs> It's off for a tour of the gardens. According to Professor Simmons, you really can find a medicine cabinet in your garden. This is, this is ginkgo tree. It's got this very, very distinctive um, leaf mm -hmm. here. And the leaves contain some compounds that increase blood flow. Mm -hmm and therefore has two uses. One is a cosmetic use right. to increase blood flow so that it will increase circulation, etc. Yes, but the other side of interest is to increase blood flow for memory. It's one of the plants where they have got uh, some clinical data. Pharmaceutical companies aren't stupid. They've long since cottoned on to the power of plants. Wow, this one. Yes, this is the, uh, the Taxus yew tree. This is very toxic, especially the needles here. 
but what was isolated uh, back in the 1970s was Taxol. You would tap the anti-cancer drug? That's right, from the needles. From the needles. The last thing somebody uh, should take if they're actually suffering from cancer is to think that they're going to get a treatment by actually taking these things because there is so, such a big difference from taking, you know, taking something like this and eating it and having it um, prepared in the right way and that's what a lot of time is spent and money by the pharmaceutical industry turning a leaf like this into a drug that can be used as a medicine. Okay. The tour continues at the top secret Jodrell laboratory. Welcome to the Jodrell. The team here are studying every inch of Q's plant collection to discover new drugs. Pharmaceutical drugs, like ones developed here, have to go through years of expensive testing before they hit the shelves. Many herbal remedies have not had this kind of scientific investment. But surprisingly, some do have real proof. Some of our larger high street chains will be selling products that, where there is some clinical uh, evidence associated with them. So things like St John's Warts, etc., where you know over the years they have collected trial data about to support the, the claims that are made. But if herbals do work, just like modern medicine, they can have side effects. I meet so many people who tell me that they're taking something that's herbal and then they go on to tell me that's natural and therefore it, it seems to follow automatically to them that natural equals safe and that's just not the case, is it? Herbal remedies can be very, very powerful and that's why they really do need to, need to be uh, treated with respect because you've actually got something that has got an active ingredient in. If you're being prescribed westernised drugs, Whatever you do, don't take these two in combination without getting advice. Something that Sarah Jackson found out to her cost. When I was doing my weekly shopping, I picked up um, some St John's Wort tablets and I'd heard that uh, these tablets can lift your spirits if you're feeling a bit down. So I thought, oh, I'll try those. Keeping up with her two young sons, Sarah was always on the go. And she thought this herbal remedy might help to ease the winter blues. I took it for at least three days, possibly I took about a week, um, and then I forgot all about them because they were in a different handbag and I just forgot to take them. But just a week on the remedy was enough to give her some pretty big side effects. I had no idea how powerful St John's wort was. Um, I did read the label before I took the tablets and it did say consult your doctor, as they all do. Um, but I had n absolutely no idea the impact that they would have. As a consequence of taking the St John's wort, Sarah went from a mum of two to a mum of three. Come on, Ned. Are you ready for milk? Are you ready for your milk? I was so shocked at finding out I was pregnant. Um, my doctor asked me if I had, when I was taking the oral contraceptive pill, if I'd been ill, had had been sick, which I hadn't been. There was no reason at all um, until I found in my handbag this St John's Wort tablet, and I did say to the doctor in the next visit, could that could that have caused? And she said most definitely would have been just a St John's Wort tablet affecting the, the contraceptive pill, but I had no idea that that could happen. No idea. Are you going to bite his nose? But now he's here. We wouldn't change it for the world, you know. Um, absolutely. Uh. It's well known that St John's wort can reduce the body's ability to absorb the contraceptive pill, as well as many other drugs. And many other herbal remedies also interact with conventional drugs. <laughs> Professor Regan has seen the benefits herbals can bring, but also the dangers. Has this put her off putting them into her pharmacy? Herbal medicines can be powerful and effective drugs, but just because they come from plants doesn't mean that they're harmless. In fact, if they're effective as drugs, they're likely to be accompanied by side effects. So before you take a herbal remedy, do make sure that you've consulted an expert. Many herbal remedies haven't been scientifically proven to work, so those don't make it in. 
But those that do have evidence, like St. John's wort, ginkgo, and echinacea, will be on Professor Regan's shelves. But she'd like more than just echinacea for the cold section of her pharmacy. Professor Regan needs a way of combating this killer, the common cold virus, the most efficient and successful virus known to man. One healthy cell in the center of the picture has been infected. As the virus replicates, it takes over and kills all the cells around it. In just 24 hours, one virus particle can become one million. This is the man charged with stopping it in its tracks. So this is what really healthy cells look like. You can see that the cell membrane is intact. It's quite regular. The cells are in, in contact with each other. The, the nuclei, which you can see in blue, um, are fairly even in shape. So we can contrast these normal cells with what happens in the infected cells. And you can see that these cells are, are strung out. They're irregular in shape. They've lost their ability to attach. So they're just turning into machines for making more virus and for pumping out virus particles from the cell. So that destroys their ability to you know, line the nose and make the nose do all the things that it should normally do. These researchers stockpile the cold virus, over 300 million particles in a single vial. They're used at the front line of cold research, which is generally up someone's nose. Just take a nice big sniff. Professor Openshaw's team of researchers deliberately infect healthy volunteers with these viruses. Sniff for me. Ready, go. Then they wait to see what happens. The cold virus is an extremely hard disease to crack because there is no one common cold, rather hundreds and hundreds of different strains. Great, then head forwards. Each time we have a cold, our immune system builds defenses against that particular strain of virus. But when another variation comes along, we get a cold all over again. <coughs> I've got a blocked up nose, uh, my voice has changed, um, my throat hurts a bit, and I've got lots of nice green phlegm, so, yeah. um, okay. you know. Given that we each suffer two to four colds a year, we're all desperate for a solution. And the pharmaceutical companies have cottoned on to that. Whole sections of pharmacies are given over to colds. The most popular products are all-in-one remedies. A handy painkiller, throat soother and decongestant mixed up in one little sachet or pill. But Professor Regan wants to know, are they worth the price? Most things that you actually take for the common cold are really just directed at making your symptoms better, make you feel better. So, you know, if you get a bit of a headache or you've got a fever, then it'll bring the temperature down or it'll stop your headache. But they also potentially have side effects. You know, some of the drugs which shrink down the lining of the nose and help you to breathe better also have an action which, for example, makes you feel rather buzzy, like you've had too many cups of coffee make you sleep badly, they can even give you hallucinations, they can make your heart pound. They won't unblock your nose and they won't stop you sneezing virus over other people. They won't stop you passing the cold on, which is really what, what we'd like to be able to do. So when it comes to treating your symptoms, what would Professor Openshaw recommend? The ordinary, you know, homely advice to have a hot drink is actually quite good advice. It seems to um, provide a lot of the placebo effect that you want with many of these medications, which are quite important, and at the same time are completely harmless. So a nice, you know, hot black black currant drink or um, you know a hot toddy are often quite as good and maybe better in terms of side effects than some of the more complex or pharmaceuticals. Even chocolate can be a DIY remedy. In one study. Half a bar of the stuff was shown to be a powerful cough suppressant. Oh. 
So Professor Regan has found both branded and generic painkillers and some herbal remedies a place on her pharmacy shelves. But the goal of modern medicine now is more about prevention than cure. What if she could make all these pills redundant and find a way to avoid ever getting sick in the first place? As a practicing surgeon, Professor Regan is used to using the latest techniques to treat people already suffering with disease. This lady's going to have a subtotal hysterectomy, which means we're going to take out the body of the uterus, containing all the fibroids, which have made her periods dreadful for many, many years. But Professor Regan also knows how crucial it is to catch diseases before they've really taken hold. Not just because that's her job, but because it saved her life. I went for my routine yearly mammogram and ultrasound scan for the breast because I've got a strong family history of breast cancer, and so I've been having these for, ooh, 10, 15 years. Two and a half years ago, she was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer. It was a strange moment being told that you, you've got breast cancer. I looked at this person whom I knew very well, personally and as a colleague, and thought, no, 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 you've got this wrong. And then I thought, no, she hasn't got this wrong, so that's why she's telling me. And then, but this shouldn't happen to me, this happens to other people. And then thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Professor Regan was lucky. Her cancer was detected early, and she's now cured. Well, it was a little bit of a fight, but we got there in the end. <laughs> Picking up disease before it's even started is the newest promise of modern medicine. It could be the solution to our deepest, darkest fears. I worry about my weight and the impact that has on my health. Uh, longer term, health worries me. I do worry about heart disease because my dad's had a triple heart bypass. I, I worry about my health now, I'm a bit older, but I'm not paranoid yet. The idea that medicine can nip any potential disease in the butt could be the biggest money spinner in pharmaceutical history. Professor Regan's decided to investigate two areas where modern medical technology is now available direct to the customer at a price. First up, coming to a church hall, synagogue, community center, or even a scout hut near you, a company that claims it could save your life for 150 pounds. Lifeline screening began in the US 15 years ago, and now they're here. They focus on specialist ultrasound tests. They scan your arteries and bones to check for risks of stroke, heart disease, and osteoporosis. What brings people to spend money on this? I have a six-year-old daughter, and I feel that I'd really like to do as much as I can for my health to try to make sure that I'm around for her for as long as possible. My father died at 59 of uh, hardening of the arteries, and it seems sensible that I took some steps to see if I was on the correct course. I mean, my father had three heart attacks before he was 60. Mm -hmm. So, um, man, it all said to me, I should go. Thank you. I just want me to lie down here. Yep. Professor Regan is going to subject herself to the full lifeline treatment. The ultrasound technician first looks at the main blood vessel in the abdomen. If this was to rupture, it could kill you. This is for the risk of a fracture due to osteoporosis. They examine her bones to make sure they're not likely to fracture. Finally, they look at the carotid artery blood vessels in the neck mm. <laughs> to check they aren't likely to block and cause a stroke. So your blood flow here is nice and normal. It's mm -hmm. below 110 centimeters per second. The only difference All Professor Regan's results were good. But does that mean she need not worry about her health anymore?
She's asked Lifeline to convince her that their tests are worth the money. They've sent Joel Risers to argue their case. Professor Regan has also invited along Dr. Martin Lobley, a GP and medical journalist with a specialist interest in well-person screening, to help her with the cross-examination. If I was skeptical about this, yes. and I looked at this advert, so it says, we could help you avoid a stroke. Can you envisage a situation in which you would be accused of scaremongering by this advert? Well, you talk to our people. What brought them to the screening wasn't that they got a piece of paper in the mail that made them go, oh, horrors, this is terrible, I need to run right in. No, what made them come in is that they had experiences already in their personal lives that made them wary and made them want to be proactive. When they got our flyer, what they saw was a way to do that. I'm a little concerned about the marketing, but I've had two invitations for screenings, I don't think appropriately. And outside of a particularly narrow age band, if you're between 60 and 69 or 65, 75, depending on which papers you read, there really isn't much point in having your abdomen scanned at all. But you will sell that service to anybody who comes into your doorway, whether they're too old for surgery or they're too young to bother. We admit that the direct mail lists that we can purchase are not always perfect when it comes to age, which is why we're honest about the age group that we're looking at. And if you fall underneath that age group, feel free to throw it in the bin. The lifeline tests are only appropriate for certain age groups. One of the tests, examining the carotid artery, is designed to pick up furring in the arteries, which could cause a stroke. Carotid artery screening, the procedure it may well lead on to, having the artery scraped clean, has a 1 in 30 mortality rate or severe, as in another stroke, side effect rate. It may just be that most people that age have furry carotid arteries. A very low proportion go on to have a stroke and we're harming more than we're helping. We are screening people and providing them with the information on the status of their arteries, whether they may have mild or moderate or very significant carotid artery stenosis. It is the job of the GP and yourself to make that call. We don't refer, nor do we recommend any treatment. These tests were designed for patients who have been found to have other clinical signs of arterial disease. There is not yet evidence that the results of these tests are reliable when they are performed on healthy people. Next, Professor Regan wants to look at an even newer technology that promises something even more far-reaching, the ability to read your future from your own DNA. One of the most popular sites is DecodeMe. DecodeMe.com invites me to decode yourself, your genes, your health, your ancestry. Click to play video. Well, the way it works is uh, you send us a sample from the inner cheek of your mouth, and we measure up to a million different DNA markers. So you have a personal profile about which diseases you are at higher risk for based on the information that comes from your DNA. The Decode Me tests cost up to $1,000. You don't need to speak to a doctor, and within just a few weeks, you can log in to be told your risks of disease. So this gives you an opportunity to empower the individual, in the case of Decode Me, to be able to do something to him better their lives. It sounds as though that's the answer, isn't it? That it's going to resolve all of my problems and answer all of the questions I would ever have about my health for the future, but I'm not sure that that's what it does. You know, what do you do if you find that you've got Alzheimer's? To my knowledge, there isn't a cure for it, so knowing that you're more likely to get it is... Do you want to know that when there isn't a cure out there available for it? Isn't it going to actually make you feel very miserable? To face Professor Regan, Decode Me have flown in from Iceland their founder and CEO, Dr. Stephenson. To help her get to the bottom of these genetic tests, Professor Regan has invited in Dr. Christine Patch, a member of the Human Genetics Commission and chair-elect of the British Society for Human Genetics. Do you regard Decode Me as a sort of intellectual activity of curiosity or as a sort of health screening service? It's a combination of these two. So you can find buried in your genome an awful lot of important information on yourself, including your risk 
of very, very serious diseases. And it gives you an opportunity to react on that knowledge or not. But if I come to you and I do a test which shows that I have a much greater risk of Alzheimer's than, for example, Christine, what do I do about that? Uh, for the moment, there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. But I'm now distraught. It would, you know, be sad if you would be distraught. But this is your choice to decide that you want to know this. So if you think that you will be afraid of the results of your Alzheimer's disease, I would recommend to you that you should not look at it. It is very patronizing to say to people, you cannot learn more about yourself, you cannot learn about your genetic risk of diseases, because you don't fully understand the implications. It isn't yours or mine to take the right, that right to self-determination of people. So after hearing from the companies, what do Professor Regan's medical experts think of these tests? So Christine Martin, after that, what are your thoughts? Mainly, if we're going to practice preventative medicine, we have to change people's behaviours and Nothing I saw today convinced me that those organisations will actually change a patient's behaviour. The general advice you might give after the results of any of these tests that predict future health is the advice we already know, which is to stop smoking and lose weight and do more exercise and eat a healthy diet. And I'm not sure that in terms of preventative health at the moment that these tests would add anything more th than that. Has Professor Regan been convinced by these screening tests? For those people who might be at risk of disease, tests with proven benefits are already available on the NHS. For everyone else, sticking to a healthy lifestyle is the best way to prevent disease. Until there is more evidence that genetic or ultrasound screening of healthy people delivers preventative benefits, these types of health checks won't make it into Professor Regan's pharmacy. Professor Regan's scientific search is finally over. She's discovered the branding on painkillers could actually give an extra element of pain relief. She's found the herbal remedies that work, like St. John's wort, but knows they can have the same side effects as any other medicine. And she's uncovered those products, like homeopathy, where the evidence just doesn't stack up. After all that research, what advice does she have? Even in a pharmacy, you have to remember it's still a shop. And after all, these companies want to sell you something. So always read the claims really carefully and ask to see the evidence that the product is going to really match up to your expectations. If you follow Professor Regan's rules and always ask to see the science, you too can be sure of buying products that would deserve a place on the shelves of Professor Regan's scientifically proven pharmacy.